I'm Julia Volkman and this is a talk about neuroscience and data that supports the Montessori method. Neuroscientific research in general tries to link physiologic data with behavioral data. So for example, if people are studying for the um, LSAT to take the to go to law school, they want to take a course that will help them improve the scores on their LSAT test. In this top graph, the dark gray bars show the scores they achieved before taking the test. The I'm sorry, before doing practice for the test. And the light gray bars show how their scores improved um, after preparing for the test. On the bottom part of the screen, you can see some red and pink and white highlightings on, on images of a brain. And that's showing you that that practice work that improved their test scores also changed the connectivity of their brain. So that's what neuroscientific research tries to do. It tries to link behavior with brain changes. Now, there's not a lot of research on Montessori and neuroscience. Um, most of the research is on neuroscience is on typically developing children. And typically developing humans may or may not reflect what actually happens in optimally developing humans, similar to those as we, my hypothesis is you'll see, um, come through Montessori environments. So the data that we're going to talk about here is based on typically developing um, humans as we know them to be now. Let's start from the beginning. The brain is not fully formed at birth. We're born with most of the neurons that we'll ever have, which is somewhere around 86 billion neurons, plus or minus 8 billion, plus or minus 8 billion, which means the person sitting next to you could have 8 billion more neurons than you, or 8 billion fewer neurons than you. And that would be fine. We don't know that that number of neurons has any connection with intelligence. We just don't know that yet. We do know that we start with a much smaller brain than we end up with, and about 80% of our brain growth happens before age 2. What influences that brain growth is both what we start with genetically and our environmental experiences. You really can't say one is more important than the other. You can't have um, one without the other. Our genes are turning on and off all the time based on our experiences and our environment. And this picture is, darling, this picture of two twin brothers. And you can see how dramatically different their bodies are based on how they interacted with their environment. Well, the same types of changes happen in the brain. And now with imaging, we're starting to be able to visualize what those changes look like. But how we exert ourselves and interact with the environment dramatically influences how our brain develops. And this is called plasticity, these changes in how the brain is physically structured and how it functions is called plasticity, and it's miraculous. We must be humble before this miracle because we can't explain it all. Who knows if we ever will be able to explain it all, but the potential for the brain to overcome continually seemingly insurmountable odds exists, and it's visible to us again and again and again and again. The amount of plasticity that we have typically varies with age, and this top red line shows us the normal amount of um, plasticity that's effortless. This is what is influenced by experience, and in early life you can see experience just dramatically influences how the brain changes. It's not so much about what we try to do, it's just what happens to us. And later in life we can influence the brain's structure, but with effort. So that light pink line shows us as we age, we have to make more and more effort to influence the plasticity of our brain. But you can see that it is still possible. Throughout our life, we can change the physical structure of our brain. And either it's without much effort when we're younger, or it's with more and more effort as we age. Take a particular note of this earliest part of the graph um, from birth to age six, Montessori's absorbent mind period. That's when um, the brain effortlessly changes. That's why it's called the absorbent mind. She was so accurate in, in terming it that way. So how does it change? First of all, it's growing connections. And connections proliferate in early childhood. You can see these different images are of um, um, parts of the brain from birth um, through age two. And in each of these images, you can see probably about the same number of round black circles those are the nuclei or soma 
also called cell body of the neuron. And a neuron is just a name for a nerve cell in the brain. So what's changing among these different images is not the number of neurons, not the number of, brown, of round circles, but the number of skinny lines, those are the connections between the neurons. And you can see down right near the black um, circle, there's lots of skinny part coming off the end. Those are dendritic branches. And then there's these long parts. Those are the axons. Those are the axons there. And so what we're doing is growing a lot of dendritic branches and a lot of axons. Now growing connections, it means making a thicker cortex, more gray matter. The gray matter is the outer shell of the brain. It's kind of like the skin on a grape. It's all around the outer edge. The inner white matter is the myelinated axons. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But the gray matter is where the neuron cell bodies, those round black circles, and the dendritic branches are located. The challenge is that overcrowded connections are actually inefficient. So while we're growing connections like crazy in early life, those connections are not easy to use. Think about it this way. You're going from point A up to point B at the top. And you've got to get through this mass, this jungle of connections. It's like you have to hack your way through with a machete to make a trail. It's not at all efficient. It's very difficult and time consuming. And this isn't just at age two. This mass of, of um, can connections, this thick, thick cortex happens up through about age 13 in different parts of the brain. So depending on what you're trying to do, it can be, take you a long time to make your way through to where you need to go. Now pruning is what happens in order to make those connections more efficient. So here on the left you can see we have these sparse connections. Here in the middle around age 7 we have a proliferation of connections and then at age 15 you have fewer connections. Those are more efficient and easier for you to work with. You can get from point A to point B much more quickly, much more quickly. But here at age seven, so think about at age three, four, five, seven, you say, okay, it's time to go. Let's get our shoes on. And what happens? You wait and you wait and you wait. And it seems like it takes forever. Why? Because they've got to go through this jungle to get to point B. And if we have the patience, we'll see that they actually get there and they'll get their shoes. But usually we don't have the patience and we say, okay, come on, no, really, let's go, let's go. And we hurry them along. This can actually be counterproductive and we'll talk more about why we need to wait for them. But pruning connections is what, what we mean when we say that is we mean we're making a thinner cortex. So we're actually making less gray matter because we have more refined connections all around those, those nuclei. And we're getting stronger axons, which is more white matters. And so pruning means practice makes permanent. That's what you say in cognitive neuroscience. Practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent. And Maria Montessori said the mind is made by the work of the hands. And that's what it means. By applying yourself again and again, you get strong connections. Now, plasticity changes at different times. In the sensitive periods, you have more plasticity. And these are when biology is driving you to get certain experiences. And those experiences are then influencing the growth and pruning of your brain, of your connections, right? And you can think of it this way. Look at this poor little girl. She needs it now. When, they have, when children are having tantrums, it's because their biological or experience-driven needs are not being met. Their needs for their sensitive periods, their critical needs that are going to form their brain properly are not being met. And it's up to us to try and figure out what's missing and why it's not being met. So these sensitive periods are time and duration dependent. And you can see here in this beautiful illustration that so much happens in the first year of life. And that these, that not only do these different neural connections, these neural networks develop sequentially, they rely on each other. So you can see sensory pathways are the first to go in, in the first year, vision and hearing. Then language comes after that, and then higher cognitive functions. And this part on higher cognitive functions, by the way, I think there's going to be a lot more data coming out, and the line's going to look a little bit different in the future. But you can see that it does rely on these earlier pieces. It is sequential. And that's why prenatal in the first year are, is so critical to long-term brain development. That's what we rely on for the future. Here's an example of that. If you look at babies who are six to eight months old and you 
test them to see what sounds of language they can hear, they can hear sounds pretty equally no matter what language they're being raised in. But if you take those same infants and you, ta you test them again a few months later, children who are raised in an American-only environment will be able to hear, or American English rather, only environment will be able to hear the sounds er and l, but children raised in a Japanese-only environment will no longer be able to hear those sounds as effectively. And you can see that blue line going down is indicating that they were able to hear it better here, lost that capacity here, English surrounded children could hear it here and dramatically improved their capacity up there. So what this is saying is that there may be a critical period for the ability of our ears to develop um, the ability to distinguish different sounds and languages. So part of the sensitive periods and critical periods are guided by myelinization. So I raise your hand if you've heard of myelin. And most people think of it as kind of a fatty substance in the brain, and that's because it looks white, like that image we saw. It's actually living cells. This is a picture of an oligodendrocyte. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of an oligodendrocyte. So an oligodendrocyte is the cell, the living cell, that creates myelin. Over here is a picture of an oligodendrocyte. And what you see is the blue part is the neuron, the cell body, and down here is the axon of that cell these little blue parts of the dendritic branches. Now this little guy here is the oligodendrocyte and he wraps himself around the axon to create insulation, to create myelin. So myelin is a living part of it, okay? Myelin's a living part. And here in this you can see this clearly how it wraps itself around like insulation. So just like an electrical cord, the myelin um, keeps the electrical current because electricity is traveling along these axons. Okay, This is electricity, just like a cord. And the myelin keeps it going where you want it to go instead of jumping all over the place. Here's this great 3D printed image of what our myelin tracts look like in a typical adult brain. Um, and you can see that they literally create the architecture of the brain. They are strong, they're scaffolding for the brain structures. And once they become myelinated, very few uh, axons are pruned, only maybe about 8%. So once we create this myelinated structure, it's ours. We get to keep it for the most part. And this myelin is created based on experience. In this top image you can see this is a, from the visual cortex of an infant who died at birth, never opened her eyes. There's no myelin on this axon. This um, is from an infant who died at also nine months gestational age, but an infant who had been born at seven and a half months, and so had six weeks of visual experience before dying. And you can see this child has myelin on their axons. Myelin was created because of the visual experience that the child had. This is why Montessori said the child is an embryo in whom nothing exists but nebulae, which have the power to develop spontaneously, certainly, and you could say nebulae is biology, but only at the expense of the environment. Its potentialities, or you could say genetics or biology, in fact must be stimulated by the environment. And so when you look throughout life, you can see this white matter is being formed throughout life. It's not just in the earliest years. But if you look in this first plane, there's the hugest spike in white matter formation. Things are more stable in plane two. And in plane three, you can notice some dips. And these dips are in the motor cortex and in the sens somatosensory cortex. Because, of course, once you get into that third plane of development in adolescence, your body has changed dramatically. And it's like you have an entirely new body to work with. And so, of course, you would have some significant changes in the architecture of your, of your brain. And this is just one example of how that would happen.